All right. <laughs> you you know me, but I'll give an intro just for anyone who's gonna watch the recording. I'm Margaret Rohde. I'm the conservation manager for Wissaken Trails. And here's some Zoom basics everyone's really familiar with by now, I'm sure, but keep your microphones muted throughout the program. You can turn your camera off for a stronger internet connection. I'm definitely leaving mine off because I have videos in this presentation and I'm gonna need a lot of bandwidth to play them. There's a chat box on the bottom of the screen where you can put any questions in that come up for you throughout the program. And I'll answer them probably as I go, as I see them pop up, but we'll also have some time at the end for questions and answers. And this is being recorded, so it'll be available online probably in a few days. And this is just a little bit about who we are as Wissican Trails, in case anyone is in, unfamiliar with us. So we're a small environmental organization. We're based in Ambler. This is our office. It's literally a barn, so we call it the barn. And it's at Four Mills Nature Reserve. We were founded back in 1957 with the goal of protecting land and water particularly in the Montgomery County portion of the Wissick and Creek watershed. And if you haven't ever heard the word watershed defined before, a watershed is all of the land over which water passes as it drains to a body of water. So in our case, the Wissick and Creek. So our Wissick and Creek watershed is 64 square miles of land. And since we were established, We've successfully saved almost 1,300 acres of land within the watershed from being developed, which is really significant, as you all probably know, in an area where development is really rampant. And all of these protected acres that we have lie on the ancestral territory of the Lenape people, which is important for us to acknowledge. And that land is spread out across 12 nature preserves, all of which have trails that are open to the public every day, free of charge. And we're really focused on protecting land and water and making habitat better by actively managing our preserves because that means our water is cleaner, that plants and wildlife have places to live and that we have green places to visit where we can connect with nature. Our well-being is tied to every other living thing and the living systems around us. And we really believe that people benefit when nature thrives. And of course, if that speaks to you, I hope you'll consider becoming a supporter of our work if you aren't already, because everything that we do is community supported. We don't get any federal, state, or local funding aside from some occasional grants. So we only do what we do in partnership with individuals who feel the same love for the natural world and the desire to protect it that we do. All right. So where do we ban birds? At Crossways Preserve. So this is located in Whitpain Township. These are just a couple of maps to orient you. On the left, this map shows all of our protected lands in dark green. Crossways is kind of in the middle there. And then on the right, it's highlighted in a little bit of a satellite image so that you can see what the surrounding landscape is like. So it's made up of a diversity of habitats from forested and open wetlands like are pictured here, to meadows and mature historic woodlands. And that diversity of habitats means that we have a really high diversity of bird species. I think something over like 107 have been documented at Crossways. And so it's a really important place for birds at every stage of their lives, from breeding and nesting and migrating through in the spring and fall to spending the winter there. And before we get into details about our bird banding program, I wanna mention some points about why people even study birds. The first is our connection to them. Human societies have been really closely tied to birds for thousands of years for economic, cultural, and even spiritual reasons. In a lot of cultures throughout the world, they serve as ambassadors of the environment and as symbols of conservation. 
That's partly because of all the creatures that exist in the wild. They make themselves more visible to us, the most within our reach than anything else, offering us a connection to the wildness that exists in nature that otherwise we might feel pretty separated from. They not only connect us to nature, but through their amazing migrations, they connect us to other areas of the world. And because of their beauty, their ability to fly, which is insane, and their incredible migrations, to put it simply, they have the power to inspire us. They keep the earth in balance. Birds contribute to the diversity of plant life through pollination and seed dispersal. For example, one blue jay, like the one pictured here on the left, plants roughly 150,000 acorns in a single year. And one hummingbird can visit hundreds of flowers over the course of one day. They also help control populations of insects, things like gypsy moths and other invasive species, not to mention mosquitoes, which is why I threw in a picture of a chimney swift on the bottom right there. One of those birds can eat about a thousand mosquitoes in a single day. And then also birds create important cavity nesting for other species. Woodpecker holes, for example, are used by flying squirrels and other mammals. And then finally, Birds serve as really important indicators for scientists about the state of the environment. Since they're high on the food chain, they respond really quickly to changes in other biological populations. So in plant life and in insect life, and that helps us know what's going on at the landscape scale. And I threw this quote in here because it kind of sums up everything that I just said. Birds matter because they give us wings. And because if we save the birds, we will save the world. It's pretty lofty, but I believe in that. Okay, so what is banding exactly? To put it simply, banding involves the safe capture of wild birds to study individuals and therefore populations over time. And I'll get into exactly how that is done in a minute. Generally, bird banding helps us monitor populations to determine their longevity. So how long do they live? as well as year-to-year -year variations, like are they arriving and breeding earlier, migrating away sooner? Answering these questions is particularly important in understanding the effects of a changing climate on wildlife populations, which is something that's becoming more and more pressing. What we are most focused on at Crossways is collecting data on survival, productivity, and recruitment. And these parameters are really key for us and I'll explain them and talk more about them soon. And all of these data inform us about things like how land use and management might be influencing their populations. Having that understanding can help us make more informed decisions on how best to manage and conserve the land that birds and other wildlife need to thrive. Somebody that I once knew actually said that by banding birds and collecting all the data we collect, we're answering questions we haven't even thought of yet, which I think is a really cool way to look at this. So the banding that we do at Crossways Preserve is part of the MAPS project, Monitoring Avian Productivity and Survivorship. And this project was created by the Institute for Bird Populations, which is a nonprofit based out in California, and they are dedicated to the research on abundance, distribution, and ecology of birds. And this came about because for decades, annual surveys like the Christmas bird count, breeding bird surveys, the winter bird census, were showing significant declines in a lot of species. So we all knew birds were dying in dangerous numbers, but we didn't know why. The MAPS project was established in 1989 as a way to figure out what the main drivers of a population's decline are. Where in a bird's life cycle they are most vulnerable? Is it survival from year to year or simply how many young they're producing? And how do these variables connect? With more information, we can figure out essentially how best to direct conservation efforts for the species that need help. So our goals by banding are continuing to contribute to this huge growing database, which consists of around 400 banding sites in North America, Canada, and Mexico that all operate the same way we do under the same standardized 
protocols to help scientists better understand population loss and to study if and how our own efforts and actions on the ground are influencing the birds that use our sites. And it's also a great way for us to share the beauty of birds and how special they are with others. And I can tell you from personal experience that seeing a bird up close can make for an amazing memory. And it's something <clears throat> that we really hope to create for other people. Now is the fun part. How do we actually catch birds? <laughs> it's not by running around with butterfly nets, which is usually the first thing people ask me. We use mist nets. And these are set up the day before banding. Um, I'm going to play this video. Hopefully it won't be too jumpy for you. So they're set up the day before banding. We furl them very tightly so that no birds can get caught overnight. And then we even secure them with zip ties just in case it's a little bit windy out. We open them at sunrise and then they're open for six hours. And that's what is standardized across all of these banding stations. And they have four pockets, which you can kind of see in the video. So they're made of fine nylon and they're mesh that the birds basically can't see. So as they fly around normally, they will hit the net and drop into one of those pockets. And there are eight of these nets set up in a loop in different habitats so that we can catch a diversity of species as much as possible. And we walk that loop to check and clear the nets every 30 to 40 minutes. Or if it's a little bit hot out or misting, we'll check them more frequently. And we don't band if it's really raining or if it's too windy, since that makes being in a net unsafe for birds, especially if it's cold or rainy. That changes how they regulate their body temperatures because birds regulate body temperatures by puffing up their feathers. So if they're in the net, they can't do that. And when birds are caught, they're carefully extracted. And this is the most complicated part that takes a lot of years of practice. Um, and then they're placed in lightweight cotton bags, which you'll see in a second. And these bags are breathable. They're handmade out of sheets. <laughs> and they're lightly colored so that the birds don't get too hot. And then the, the bags themselves are hung on carabiners. And they are colored according to band size. And I'll explain that a little bit more later. So once all of the nets have been checked, we'll take all the birds back to our small setup where we begin processing them. And those carabiners, they correspond to band sizes, as I said. And so that's important because when we get back to the banding station, we ban the smallest birds first. So we know what's, what size bird is in what bag without having to take the bird out. Um, and they also have clothespins on them that have the net number of the net that they were taken from. And that's just important data for us to record so that we know what habitat they were caught in. And these are some of the tools that we use to open and attach bands. We have special openers. That's the photo all the way on the left. And then we have these flyers that have specifically machined holes in them. So when the band goes in those holes, it will only close to a certain size. Um, and you'll see, you'll see this in action here. So all of these, each bird is banded with a uniquely numbered band. And these are made by the US Geological Survey and given out to only permitted banders. So they have a seam down one side, which allows us to open them with those special pliers and then we use different size pliers for different birds and close the band gently on their leg. And these are lightweight aluminum. They weigh almost nothing. Um, and the, the point of putting different size bands on a bird obviously is that you want it to fit the bird comfortably. So our goal is to secure it onto the leg so that no vegetation will be caught in it. So the seam has to be very tight 
and so that it can spin and move up and down the bird's leg and it won't hinder them or slip off. And after we put the band on, the next step is to figure out how old the bird is. Was it born this year, last year, or the year before? And broadly, we call that hatching year or after hatching year. The reason that this matters is because it helps us determine what stages in a bird's life cycle are driving changes in the populations by allowing us to estimate a key demographic parameter, productivity. And that is the rate at which young are produced. So we can estimate it by comparing the number of hatcher birds caught throughout the summer to the number of adults caught. And to talk about aging, we have to talk about molt, which can be very complicated. <laughs> but molting is the process of a bird shedding old, worn feathers to replace them with fresh plumage. It usually happens in a predictable sequence. So a, a molt can be partial, incomplete, and only certain feathers are replaced or complete and all the feathers are replaced at once. In a lot of species, I'd say in most species, their first molt will be either partial or incomplete. And that produces what we call a molt limit. And this is just the extent to which they have molted. So you can see that in this photo, this is an American goldfinch. So these two feathers that my cursor is on are new feathers that were molted in. The remaining feathers are brown and faded. Those are its juvenile feathers that it retained. So that's an example of in a partial molt. And then in their second molt, in the second summer of their lives, they will replace all of their feathers. So everything's gonna be looking the same on those feathers. There won't be any differences in appearance, color, sheen, length, or wear. So by looking for molt limits, we can figure out how old a bird is. And I'll talk through this a little bit more in an example with an Eastern bluebird. So imagine that it's 2021 and this Eastern bluebird is hatching out at Crossways Preserve. So here it is in its first days of life. It's got its first set of juvenile plumage. And you can see that there are some specific things that occur in the juvenile plumage that don't occur in the adult plumage. Among them are these spots on the base of these feathers, which are the greater coverts. And a lot of young birds, especially in bluebirds and in thrushes, have these kinds of spots. And that's because when they're growing up and they're living in the woods and their parents are feeding them, they need to be as camouflaged as possible. And that recreates more of that dappled look. So they're harder to spot the predators. So anyway, that bird has its juvenile plumage. Now imagine we're going into the fall and it's gonna do its first molt. And at that point, it's only gonna replace some feathers like we talked about with that partial or incomplete molt. So you can see that that has happened. Imagine this is the fall here and we'll just pretend this is the same bird even though it's not. But so these feathers are all new and they are a little bit longer than the old retained juvenile feathers. They're gonna look a little bit shinier, like higher quality in the hand. And that's because juvenile feathers on a bird are grown super fast because they wanna get out of that nest. That's the most dangerous stage of a bird's life. So they grow them really quickly and they don't put a lot of resources into them. So those feathers are a little bit weaker. They degrade a lot faster and they fade a lot more than their feathers once they're into their second and third molts. So when we catch this bird, Again, it'll go through the winter and retain that molt limit between the old juvenile feathers and the new ones. And then if we catch it in the spring, we'll be able to say it's a second year bird because it has a difference in generations of feathers. Then it'll go through its second molt where it's gonna replace everything. So all the body feathers, all the flight feathers and all the wing feathers, the wing coverts. And then it's gonna look all the same like this bird on the right. And it's gonna be fresh, shiny, beautiful plumage. And so we know it's an after hatch year or after second year bird. So that's a lot. It takes a long time to learn the differences because different birds have different molt strategies. So they're gonna molt different feathers. But once you key in on it and you, you see enough birds to recognize the differences in the feathers, then aging becomes a fun challenge.
So now I'll show a couple of videos of all of this happening since you understand what goes on at the banding station. <laughs> and this is a cedar wax wing. So that's that special band opener that we have that opens the band at its seam. And then it goes into the appropriately sized hole on those pliers. And then you gently slide it over the bird's leg and give it a little squeeze and make sure it's nice and tight. This is an orchard oriole, so I'm weighing it here. That's one of the things that we collect data on is the bird's weight. Weighing the bag. We had scale problems last year, so I had to go back to using the spring scale instead of setting the birds on a scale flat on the table. So it added an extra element. And now you can see the whole process again of opening the band, putting it into those pliers, and then onto the bird's leg. And you can band on either leg. I just typically band on their left leg. Now what I'm gonna do here is measure the wing. That's an important thing. So some species you can actually tell male or female by wing length, not in orchard orioles, cause you can tell that by plumage, but some birds that have the same plumage, sometimes you can break them out male or female based on wing length. So that's some of the other information that we collect. And a lot of times we tell male or female by looking for breeding characteristics and condition. So males have something called the cloacal protuberance and that's where they're gonna store sperm. And at different parts of the year, that's very visible and changes. So we, we record that information. And then we also look at body fat and we can look for brood patches. So on female birds, when they get to a certain point in the season because of hormone shifts, they'll start to lose the feathers on their bellies and that area will become more fluid filled and highly vascularized. And the reason for that is so that they can then incubate the eggs and more efficiently transfer their body heat to the eggs. Eggs don't even start developing until female birds begin brooding on them. And in some cases, some males also brood, I should throw that in there, but mostly females. So they'll lay about an egg a day and then once they've laid all the eggs, that's when they'll start incubating because then the eggs will develop at the same rate. So if we see a brood patch on a bird, and this is on a gray cat bird, which are, their sexes look the same. They don't have differences in plumage. So by seeing that brood patch, we can say it's a female. And then the picture on the left, you can see a little bit of fat on this bird. So their skin is translucent and their muscle looks purple underneath while the subcutaneous fat looks kind of yellow, like on a chicken. So we look in their furcular hollow, which is like their collarbone area. And we do that by blowing the feathers aside. And then we can literally see fat deposits and that gets different, that there's a numbered system for how much fat storage a bird has. Most of the time, because we're looking at birds on their breeding grounds and they're not migrating, and so they don't need to store a lot of fat and have a lot of fuel. There's not a lot of body fat on them. In the spring and fall, you might blow the feathers apart and look for fat and it's very obvious and bulging. And then that's it, we let them go. And that was a wood thrush. <laughs> And recaptures are an extremely part, important part of this project. 
And this is when we catch birds that we've already caught and banded in previous years. And why recaptures represent vital data is because they tell us about survival, which is that other key demographic parameter that determines population growth or decline in birds. Most songbirds breed in the same area year after year. So the proportion of banded birds that are recaptured the following year is a good gauge of survival. For example, last year we caught this song sparrow and it was one that we originally banded back in 2015, which was our first year. And at that time, it was aged as a second year bird. So when we caught it last year, we could definitively say that it was six years old, which is really cool. And that's, that's really good information. And then the last thing we can learn from all of this is recruitment, which is the third and final demographic parameter that is really key to bird population changes. And recruitment is the rate that breeding individuals are added to the population, either by surviving to breeding age or by coming in from other populations. And recruitment is critical because a given population might be very productive, hatching lots of chicks, but if too few of those chicks survive to make their own chicks, or if too few individuals enter a population from elsewhere, that would mean low recruitment and the population will decline. So that's a really important factor for us to understand. And I have to put this in here because this is the most frequently asked question, which is, do they bite? And yeah, sometimes they do. Gray cat birds, that's the photo all the way on the left. They're not too bad. They're not bad at all. Cardinals, their bills are designed for crushing seeds. So you can imagine that that's not very comfortable. And when they bite, they tend to latch on and it's hard to get them to let go. <laughs> Woodpeckers, of course, will peck your fingers until they draw blood sometimes. And blackbirds, red-winged blackbirds just have really pointy bills and they always know where you have cuts or where you have little sensitive areas on your fingers like the cuticles. <laughs> and then I like to show these photos because one of my favorite things about banding birds and catching them and holding them is that you can see these really cool plumage features. So this is a northern flicker, the, the photo on the left. And in the hand, you can see that this bird has little heart-shaped centers on its undertail coverts, which isn't something that you're gonna be able to see just looking at binoculars. And then this is a great crested flycatcher. And if you read field guides about this bird, it's gonna say that it has this really beautiful lemony yellow breast, which is again, something that you might see through your binoculars, but when you see it in the hand, it's really beautiful. And the last picture all the way on the right there is a red-bellied woodpecker. If you're a beginning birder and you're learning birds and people say that's a red-bellied woodpecker and you're looking at it, you're not gonna see a red belly. And it's really confusing. But when you see them in the hand, they actually do have a red belly. <laughs> Since we started this project in 2015, we've had 867 captures, which included 622 unique birds and 245 of those birds have been recaptured. And this was across 40 species, which is actually pretty great for a preserve of our size, which is it's 57 acres. And these are some of the coolest, most unexpected birds that we caught. Starting from the left, there's a northern water thrush, which we caught this last week on our first day of banding. And then there's a Swainson's thrush, a Canada warbler, a morning warbler, and a Cooper's hawk. The first four of those birds are all migrants who breed pretty far north of us. Um, so they were at the tail end of their migration. And that was a really cool catch because we are focused on studying breeding birds. We don't often catch the cool birds that are just passing through. We only catch the ones that are gonna stick around and establish territories and breed. So these are really fun captures. And that, that bird all the way on the right, that Cooper's hawk, that was an insane catch. Hawks are very uncommon at songbird banding stations. And this one happened to be in the bottom pocket of a net and we walked up to it just at the right time because it was almost out of the net. And luckily we had a band big enough for it. And these are some of our most commonly caught species. 
Gray Catbird, Song Sparrow, American Robin, Northern Cardinal, and Common Yellowthroat. So when we look at our data, these are the top five. But there are many other species that we catch only here and there, but that are pretty common at crossways if you were to just go birding. Eastern towhee, which this was our nemesis bird for several years because we would hear them all over the preserve, right near the nets, and didn't catch them for the first five years. So they were kind of infuriating, but we finally caught a few. <laughs> and American goldfinches are really common. They nest out in the meadows. They're always around tree swallows. This is a male and female orchard oriole. And then on the bottom left, red-eyed vireo, also super common. Ruby-throated hummingbird, cedar waxwings, and willow flycatchers. And the reason some of these birds don't get captured is because some of them stay high in the trees like red-eyed vireo, so they're not gonna come down low enough to be in the nets. And some of them are also very net savvy, like the towhees. So it seems like they can perceive the net and they can also bounce out of the net pretty easily. So it's really fun when we catch these birds, even though they're really common to see, they're not that common to catch. So to kind of wrap it all up, we are in our seventh year of data collection on this project. And we've been doing a lot of habitat management since 2016, roughly. So about a year after we started banding. And we're really trying to continue to increase the diversity and availability of plants and therefore insects um, at the preserve to ensure that all of these birds have the resources that they need, food and water and cover, and plenty of places to, to raise chicks, to produce a lot of chicks, to safely molt their feathers, which takes a lot of energy. So when they're molting, they need a lot more food and they need places to be safe because when they're molting, they're also more vulnerable to predation. Um, so our goals really are to create habitat that, that also entices other birds from breeding populations to come in and create their nesting sites at crossways so that they'll be interested in moving in and establishing territories because they find that the preserve has everything that they need. And that's really important for genetic diversity of the population. And again, that's what helps with recruitment beyond just producing a lot of chicks and having adults survive. So we're going to continue to do all of that important work of improving habitats. And we're starting to look at some of the data to see if we have any trends at this point. Because it's our seventh year, we're able to start looking at that. It takes about five years, really, for you to have any kind of analysis possible where you can actually see any trends. So we're gonna start that soon. And ideally we'll have 10 years of data, 15 years of data down the road. And then we'll be able to understand better some of the impacts of all of our land management. And that will help us in the future. And we'll share that information with other land managers as well that are helping to support bird populations. And that's all I have. <laughs> So I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen. And I'll take a look at the chat for some questions. So Stephanie asked, are there some species such as a type of warbler that maybe stays higher in the canopy that would be more difficult to catch? Yes, exactly. So that's like, um, like I mentioned, red-eyed vireos are one. Blue-gray gnat catchers are definitely another one. They're so high up, we're never gonna catch them. We caught them once, but that was all. It was very exciting. <laughs> but yeah, and then like I said, there's some birds that just seem to be able to extract themselves from the net. Um, warning doves are one of those. So they'll, they'll fly into the net and then they kind of bounce right out before we can get to them. Oh, that's a good question. So Stephanie asked, how does someone get involved? Oh, it's cool. You're taking an intro to banding course at Braddock Bay. Oh, I love that place. I was up there once. <laughs> um, 
you know, it, it's hard because you do have to spend a lot of time volunteering at places and that's a good place to start. Like for me, I was really lucky and I had an internship in college where I learned how to ban birds. And then I kind of did seasonal field work in a few different areas. And that's how I gained a lot of experience. But people that I know, they would volunteer at banding stations, um, gain enough experience. And then a couple of them have established their own banding stations, small scale, like, like ours, which is just a, you know eight nets that we band about eight days a week um, or eight days throughout the summer. Uh, we don't, well, we've had a couple of volunteers come out to help us, but mostly we have so few birds that a lot of the time it's just myself and my coworker. But we have had volunteers come out and I do try to train people when I can. Um, you can shoot me an email and I'll let you know what days might work. Things were a little bit weird last year with COVID, so we kind of backed off of having a lot more groups come out, but we're trying to get back into that this year. Anybody else have any other questions or thoughts or favorite birds or anything? <laughs> All right, well, I'm gonna let you off the hook a little early then. Thank you everyone for hopping on tonight and listening to me talk about birds. <laughs> Thanks, Margaret. Thanks. Have a good night, everybody. Good night. Thanks, Margaret.